Okay, this is uh, the first topic in the marketing research course. Here we're going to do an overview of what marketing research is, uh, some of the issues and the process that is involved in marketing research and the ethics. So if you are playing along with your slides, because this is uh, not really legible in this recording, uh, you'll see that this is the topics we're covering today uh, as an introduction to what marketing research is. So first things first, uh, in terms of introducing where marketing research fits into the evidence in um, management or what we call EBM, evidence-based management. So the types of evidence that you would be familiar with if you've done um, this kind of thing before is evidence that relates to um, past experience, experience of managers, practitioners that use their judgment in order to make decisions. The other one is scientific literature, so previous studies that have been done, experiments, ethnographies, all sorts of stuff that you'll become much more familiar with because the scientific literature uses the research process, which is the same process that you'll be using this semester. Other sources of data are organisational data, so internal data like sales data, um, customer feedback data, all those sorts of things. And the last type of data you might be um, familiar with is this idea of stakeholder views and concerns. So this could be everything from um, letters to the editor, media reports, um, government reports, anything that relates to other people that are involved in an industry. So in this semester, we're actually looking at this idea of generation of information rather than the source of the data itself. So in generating information, we're going to be uh, looking at all the other four types of uh, evidence that we use in management and using those types of evidence as the raw data that we then use to, um, to analyze and then create judgments and information and recommendations on which marketers can then make decisions. So in terms of the generation of information, there are two things that we need in order to generate information. The first one is data and the second one is method or methods. So data itself includes three well, two basic areas and one that, you know, I've used as an example of um, how these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So in the first one, we have primary data. So this is when we generate new data to answer a question. So this is when we don't know the answer and there's no existing information about it because, well, we might be the only person interested in that information. For example, there is unlikely to be industry information that relates to our customers' uh, attitudes towards our brand because for various reasons, we are the only, if it's our brand, we're the only one actually interested in our customer attitudes towards our brands uh, in detail and the specifics that we might need in order to fix any problems we have with attitudes towards our brands. So this primary data can come in, in, in two basic types, it's qualitative and quantitative. So the difference between these two is, well, it's contested, basically think of them as a, as a continuum. At one end, you have qualitative data, which is very much related to things like words, things that people say, um, pictures, images, that sort of information. On the other end, we have quantitative, which is, you know, numbers, things that can be counted, measured, you know, stick a ruler up against it. It's quantitatively, objectively measurable as seven inches. So we have these sort of two broad types of data. However, in the middle, there is um, areas of contestation in terms of how you treat certain types of data. For example, in the third example, I've given you social media data. This kind of data can be treated as both qualitative and quantitative. If you have enough social media data, you can basically count the number of times something is mentioned. And that is quantitative. 
Whereas if you sit there and you look at what people are saying, how they're saying it, where they're saying it, that is more qualitative. So the second type of data that we look at is secondary data. So this is data that's produced for other purposes that we repurpose in order to answer our particular question. So these inc could include internal reports, um, external reports, media reports, um, scanner data, if, we're, you know, if we have information from um, grocery stores, it can also include social media data. So we can scrape what we call scraping information out of things like Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook, and we can use that as secondary sources to understand what's going on in the market. So in terms of the choice of the data, often this depends on how much time you have available and how much money you have available, but also secondary data is both quicker and cheaper by and large. So usually if you have secondary data that answers your, your question, the, the, the rule of thumb is that you just do secondary data because the primary data collection analysis and, and um, reporting takes time and it takes a lot more money. So here I, I've mentioned social media as both primary and secondary data. And this is the same way so social media data can be treated as both qualitative and quantitative. Social media data can also sits in this sort of gray area between whether something is new data that is produced specifically for a purpose or whether it is secondary and you are repurposing this existing um, information off the internet. And often that distinction lies in how the social media data is um, generated. So the other sorts of uh, requirement we have for generate information is we need methods. So methods include things like questions that, that include, well, what data is required to answer the question? And what data is required is, is determined by what is your question? So we'll look at the different types of questions in a little while, but um, at this point, you know, what data is needed is determined by the question. So we start with the question, what data is required? How do we then collect the appropriate type of data? If we need to be testing or measuring um, data, then asking someone their opinion on the street, you know, what do you feel about McDonald's? And they said, they're going, I love McDonald's is not necessarily a measurable response. So that's the incorrect type of data for the question being asked. And we also need to know how to analyze that data. So there are various methods of analysis and we'll go into those a bit more uh, in, a little, in a little bit later in this lecture, but we'll also go in much more depth um, as the weeks progress through the subject. And finally, what we need is the judgment to determine what are the best choices to make at each point of the research process. And also judgment in terms of what is the answer and what does that answer actually mean for the, the, the company, the business, the marketer going forward. So just note that all research is a compromise. Uh, there are always trade-offs when making these decisions. These trade-offs include things like time available. Do you need a, a snap decision made straight away? That will limit what you can um, and can't do. Money, who is paying for all of this because marketing research is an industry and they are professionals and they will charge money. The same way that respondents often will not respond to a marketing research survey or interview unless they feel that they're getting some reward and often that reward is a cash reward or some sort of product reward and someone has to pay for that. Do we have access to the people we need to talk to? So who are we getting this information from? Can we access them? Some people are just simply too remote. Um, some groups are simply too dispersed throughout a general population in order to, you know, to be effectively be able to target them specifically. And finally, do you have the expertise? Um, if you are a quantitative person, but you have a more qualitative type of question, you might not have the, the correct expertise, so therefore you might be compromising 
on how and what kind of data you, you collect because you don't feel you're able to do it um, appropriately. All right, so the research process itself. We have four general areas. There is some overlap between these areas, but when it comes to your proposals and your reports, this is the process we're going to go through throughout semester. So the first thing that needs to happen is to establish the boundaries of the research. What is the problem? What is the objectives? What are the research questions? We need to design the research. What kind of answers are we seeking here? So in terms of design, are we seeking causal relationships? Are we looking to explore what is going on in a particular um, scenario? Or are we simply trying to describe what's already there because you know, we don't know what's there yet? And then we have executing the, re the research. So this is once we've decided on the, um, the design of the research. Then we need to go collect the data. We need to interview people. We need to conduct focus groups. We need to do the survey. We need to run the experiment. Then we need to analyze the data that is generated. And some of these projects can be quite complex. They can have multiple stages and they can include multiple methods. So for example, the rule of thumb is in a lot of um, industry marketing research projects is that um, it will be a qualitative exploratory kind of uh, design first to find out what is going on in the scenario and then the second stage will be quantitative in terms of measuring the impact of those issues within a wider population. However, I've seen um, research designs which have been qualitative, quantitative, qualitative. I've seen, multi I've seen uh, designs that have been multiple types of quant, depending, um, looking at multiple target populations, one being survey, one being experiments. There are n the, 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 uh, the combinations are basically infinite. And finally, we need to communicate the results. These marketing research projects are generally commercial in confidence. You are reporting the results back to the client. You are ethically bound not to tell anyone who your client is and what you found for that client. So while you might find all sorts of information about a certain brand or product that you want to tell your friends to say, isn't this a great idea or isn't this a stupid idea, you're not allowed. Your communication is directly to that client. And that communication includes how to present the, um, the methods and the reporting and the analysis in a way that someone who may not understand the research process or understand the analysis techniques that are used can actually understand. So I know you definitely can't read this. You can, you can do uh, marketing research on uh, Wikipedia and you'll get this list. Um, basically, the marketing research types are virtually infinite because the types of marketing research decisions that need to be made are also rather endless. So included in this list are things like ad tracking. So tracking the performance and the effectiveness of a particular ad or a um, ad campaign over a period of time to look at what kind of impact it's having and its effectiveness in terms of achieving the advertising um, objectives. We also have things like brand name testing. If a company is introducing a new product into the market or a new brand for a product into the market, you know, what is the best brand to use for um, that product? So there is actually specialist marketing research firms that look at these kinds of issues. So the idea of cars, car brand name. So you have the Hyundai's choosing to number their cars. So you have the I-25, the I-30, the I-40. Those sorts of branding decisions because it gives, um, through research they realized that it gave um, consumers an easy to remember heuristic for understanding the difference between the different Hyundai um, models of cars. So they progress from an i30 to an i40 in terms of getting larger and more luxurious. Audi has used the same strategy, the A3, the A4, the A7. Whereas you've got something like a, um, a Holden car which uses things like, now I'm 
testing my knowledge of Holden cars. I have, I th no, it's Mitsubishi. They have things like Outlanders. You said, what is an Outlander? Well, it's implied there's a whole bunch of mental imagery involved in the Outlander and the fact it's got land and out, so I assume it's outland somewhere. So this kind of testing gets done in order to see whether the brand being chosen is conveying the message that the company wants to achieve in choosing that brand name. Um, customer satisfaction research, that tends to be more ongoing and um, you know, it can be um, your Uber five-star ratings or comments, your Airbnb writing comments at the end of your stay, or it could be your meal, fill in your comment card at the end of the meal. So the amount of information connect, co collected by customer satisfaction surveys can be quite vast and ongoing, resulting in the need to constantly be um, analyzing that data. And we have things like test marketing. So a test market is where a company chooses a particular location in order to launch new products into. Um, I happen to know that McDonald's uses Adelaide as its test market. It has a few stores in um, the Adelaide um, region, basically that any new kind of McDonald's product, roll, salad, that they are, are going to release to the they're thinking of releasing to the wider Australian population will first be tested in those stores in Adelaide to see whether people buy the product and they will then do surveys of customers of those stores to find out whether how much they like those products. So um, that is a test market. So it's a um, fairly resource intensive kind of research, but it gives McDonald's a much clearer idea of what kinds of um, food or drinks are going to be popular for the, the wider Australian market um, by testing in this smaller subset of stores just in Adelaide. So the phases of the marketing research process. So um, these are going to elaborate on those uh, steps I referred to previously, but we're going to talk about the five steps here of determining the scope, selecting the research method, collecting and preparing the data, analyzing that data and transforming the results into information. So this is this information generation stage. All right, so determining the scope of the research. So the client will come to a marketing research organization and say, we have this problem. So it might be, we have falling sales, we have a new product we've developed and we don't know who to sell it to, or it could be, We've, you know, we took, you know, we did previous research and we've developed a new product for this um, particular target market, but we don't know what to call it. So all of those are different problems. And each of those problems have a particular research focus or research objective attached to them. So in the first semester, in the first example where I said we have falling sales. The thing to uh, realize with falling sales is that falling sales is a symptom of some other problem. The problem is not the falling sales. Falling sales are never actually a problem all of its own. Something is causing the sales to fall. And the research project could end up being identifying what is the cause of falling sales rather than trying to find a solution for the falling sales. So when the, the client comes and tells you what their problem is, it's always important to understand that what they say their problem is might not actually be their core problem. It could be some other underlying issue that they have not recognized or have failed to recognize in of themselves. So the classic example of this is Coca-Cola and New Coke in the 80s. You've probably read this uh, case study previously, but to recap, this ended up actually being a failure but in communication between the you know, Coca-Cola, the client, in terms of what they thought the problem was and the research question that ended up being solved. So Coca-Cola had falling sales. It was falling sales. It was losing market share to Pepsi. So they thought that their um, problem was this falling market share. And because Pepsi was uh, advertising or marketing itself very effectively using its superior taste to Coca-Cola, 
Coca-Cola then interpreted its problem as we don't taste as good as Pepsi. So the research problem and the research question that then got um, answered was how to make Coca-Cola taste better rather than what the research problem should have been, which was why is um, Coca-Cola customers moving to Pepsi? And while customers might have also because of all this, what we call um, top of mind heuristics might have mentioned taste, but in amongst all of that, there should have been some acknowledgement that Coca-Cola had a branding problem. The brand was tired and they were using advertising and um, celebrity endorsers that were too old for the age group that were drinking Coca-Cola. So for example, uh, in the 80s, they were using uh, Dr. Huxtable, and I can't remember his name, but he's just gone to jail for sexual assault. Uh, and even, even in the 80s, he was everyone's favorite dad. And Coke drinkers or cola drinkers generally are younger people, you know, teens, 20 year olds, and do they really want to be drinking the same drink as their father, essentially? So these are the kinds of questions and the kind of analysis that needs to happen at this scoping phase. What is the actual problem? Not necessarily what the client has told you what the problem is. So defining the decision problem, never mind, I've sort of talked about that. So decision problems can emerge from a number of different analysis, uh, areas of um, the environment. So we have a SWOT analysis, so a strength, organization's capability to attract clientele. So if they, the, the company has developed some new technology, that is a strength of the company. We have some new tech, we have some new feature that um, competitors don't have, but we need to be able to convince customers of the value of that new tech in order for it to be effective in its um, market implementation. Uh, weakness in effective marketing mix. You know, are we priced too high? You know, or are we priced too low? Those are two different questions and that's a marketing mix question and it could be a weakness of the, the, the um, company. I have seen instances of both where um, companies have been priced too low, where people, the um, price, um, gives the perception that there's something wrong with the product. So price is your um, heuristic for quality. So if your price is too low, it says that your quality is too low. If it's too high, basically you're pricing people out of the market or you're being uncompetitive with your um, other offerings, so people are not going to demand you. So marketing mix. Um, opportunity. A competitor has decided to exit the market or a competitor has gone bust. So this idea of um, potential part, um, markets opening up because of withdrawal of a competitor, you know, how can we enter something that we might not have already done? What is the best methods? Those sorts of questions. And threats, changing of laws, regulations, these type of things. So there's all sorts of laws and regulations around certain product categories. For instance, if you are selling alcohol, it must be targeted to adults, people over 18, because that's the legal drinking age in Australia. So how do you market to young people, 18 to 25, without marketing to 17 year olds? Where is that line and how do you um, communicate or what kind of communication will you know, do one and not the other and get a company in trouble? Because if you are, there are regulations and standards and if you are deemed to be in violation of them, they can pull your product or they can pull your advertising from television or wherever you are advertising and that's a very expensive mistake. So I've already discussed this in terms of problems. So um, the second thing we've got to do is spe uh, specify the research questions. So if the problem is, so go back to the new Coke example, so instead of new Coke's problem being we don't taste as good as Pepsi and the problem becomes how do, um, how do we rejuvenate you know, the brand of Coca-Cola, we then need to look at well, how do we operationalize that problem into specific research questions that we can collect data for that can be analyzed and therefore an, an answer 
those specific questions. For instance, the, the questions themselves need to use things like how, when, what, why, where. So this idea of how do we, you know, the problem is our brand is tired. The research questions might be how do cola drinkers currently perceive Coca-Cola the brand? On what attributes do, does Coca-Cola perform well or badly? So these are the kinds of research questions where you break down the problem into specific instances that can then be answered with specific types of analysis or data. It might not be just a single type of data that's answering a research question, but there should be just one answer to each of those research questions. So there should not be a research question that says, why and uh, where and why are people using Coca-Cola? There should be one question of where are people using Coca-Cola? And there should be a question of why are people using Coca-Cola in these locations? So the next thing you do is define the research objective. So what is the point? Is the point of the research to create a new taste in Coca-Cola or better taste in Coca-Cola? Is the point of the research to rejuvenate Coca-Cola so it can relaunch into the market? Or is it just a spruce up the image? Is it to develop a new communication campaign? For what purpose is this research being done? So in answering this question, we need to consider this idea of research design. So we have three basic designs of research. So we have causal, exploratory and descriptive. So each of these fulfills a different objective, which is why I'm doing it here. So a causal research tests hypothesis about causal relationships between variables. It's very much an X and Y kind of statements. You might have multiple X's, you might have multiple Y's, but it's basically X causes Y. Increase in price causes a decrease in demand. Basic economics, yes, marketing, you know, we're still part of economics. So this idea that you test the relationship. So the question might actually be, if we increase the price by $20, I don't know what I'm selling here, if I increase the price by $20, what impact does that have on my demand? By how, how much will my demand decrease? And there are ways of testing this kind of price elasticity with um, my target market. So causal research tends to use things like experiments and certain types of surveys. The, other, the next one is exploratory kind of research and essentially this is when we don't know what's going on. So in the case of Coca-Cola, they could have done exploratory research and basically gone out into the market and said, what is going on? What are our problems with Coca-Cola? Why are you not drinking Coca-Cola? Those are all kinds of questions that exploratory research can answer. So what is, what is out there? that you know, I don't already know. Because the difference between this and causal is, in causal you need to know what your X and Y variables are. Exploratory research is very much about finding out what are the X and Y variables to begin with. You know, if you are unclear, you're unsure, exploratory is the, the kind of design that is required in order to achieve that kind of objective. And the final kind of research design is descriptive. So this is basically we describe what is happening in a particular market or a particular scenario. Um, it answers questions like what is the size of the market? What are the potential sales in a market? So it sort of sits, it's not exploratory in the fact that you know what you're looking for, but it's not causal in the fact that you're not looking for relationships between variables. It's simply, you know, the size of variables. Let's put it that way. And finally, in terms of determining the scope, we need to evaluate the likely benefit of conducting the research. Because if you're going to go out and collect primary data, it's going to be time, um, take time, and it's going to be reasonably, you know, depending on what you do, it can be expensive. 
So there can be thousands and thousands of dollars spent on research um, which may not have any tangible benefit to the company. So when it came to Coca-Cola, they did lots and lots of research, but it was on the wrong question. So therefore, you know, they had this you know, they had a marketing disaster which 30, 40 years later, we still, you know, we still talk about in terms of how badly fit the research was to the actual marketing problem. You know, however, you know, how much is it going to cost your company to, to launch a brand, to launch a product, or to make changes to price without understanding what the potential impacts of that decision are going to be? Not just legal, but also in terms of reputation, brand image, profit, all of these things need to be weighed in when determining should we go forward with this research. All right, the next stage, selecting the research method. So we have our research design considerations. Can we use, so we have three basic areas here. So can we use just secondary data or do we need to get some primary data? The secondary being, again, what is already available out there. It was collected for a different purpose, but does it have enough information in there that is usable for what I need to understand? versus primary data, which basically says, no, there's nothing out there. I need to go create or generate my own information. Do I need to get qualitative or quantitative data? So this is, you know, exploratory data tends to be more qualitative. Causal data tends to be more quantitative and descriptive data can sit between the two. It depends on your, your design. It depends on your research question. It depends on your problem. The rule of thumb is that a, lot, um, that a lot of research projects and the one that you'll be doing this semester, basically we start with secondary data, then we'll go into primary data, and in that primary data you'll be doing first an exploratory, qualitative design, and then you'll be doing a either descriptive or a causal, or possibly exploratory, quantitative design. So you will be following all that you'll be covering most of these steps as part of your research projects. And this is very similar to most research projects that are done for industry, as long as they have the budget. So how do these research designs fit in with how we understand the market and what we can um, produce or answer the kinds of questions that can be answered and the kind of results that we can give? So this is a, a um, chart that comes from a consumer behavior textbook. So uh, it's not in your actual textbook. So basically it looks at the micro behaviors versus macro behaviors. Micro behaviors are individual decisions, internal um, uh, characteristics of individuals. It's very much down to the individual, the micro of one. Macro at the broadest level is looking at societies in general. So in applying any particular research method, all of these along here are particular research methods, we can be, there's, there's a compromise that happens here. If you're looking at the micro level at the top here, we can predict or we can measure causal relationships. We can say X causes Y because we can control all the extraneous or influencing variables. So if I want to find out whether price is influencing demand, I can re weed out all other variables like taste, branding, all of those kinds of things that might muddy the water about what is causing what in terms of that, um, that relationship. So, however, in real life, those extraneous variables exist. So you, you know, when confronted by a cola decision, you will never make a, a cola, a decision about which cola you drink purely by the price of the cola. There'll always be a brand, there'll always be a position on the shelf, there'll always be other things going on that affects a particular decision that gets made, which means that that relationship between price and demand gets very, very murky as to what is, in real life, what the effects are going to be. 
So as you go down to the macro level, we look at the society at, at large, the, um, it allows us to understand all of the extraneous variables and how people were behaving within a particular social setting with all of the noise of different variables going on, but it doesn't allow us to make causal relationships between variables about this happened, so therefore that happened. So that this is more sort of descriptive and exploratory, whereas up here we can do more causal. But at the causal end, our ability to generalize to what's going to happen when you go to market is lessened. Down this end, we can be more sure of what's going to happen in the market, but we can be less sure about the relationship between causes and effects. Step three, this is no, by no means, this is a hard thing to do. This is where a lot of time and effort and a lot of money gets, gets used. Collecting and preparing the data. Particularly if you're looking at consumers or if, if you're even going to, uh, if you're a business to business kind of company, going to your customers who are other businesses, this is time consuming in the fact that you, know, you need to contact them. They need to agree to participate. They need to give you information. They need to agree to give you data. And so there is a process and then there is time and there's energy and um, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong in this process. But in terms of data collection, we need to look at what variables are being collected. How are we going to observe or measure those variables as we collect the data? And in terms of examples of how we do this, it's surveys, questionnaires, experiments, interviews, focus groups, those specific data collection methods that we will do in more depth um, and you will actually do as part of your projects. Once you've collected the data, we need to prepare the data. So if it's an interview, the interview needs to be, you know, interviews will generally be recorded. So those recordings need to be transcribed. Those transcriptions need to be put in. And how are you going to analyze, you know, if you've done a three hour interview, how are you going to analyze three hours of text? These sorts of things need to be considered the same way as a survey. If it's a paper survey, someone needs to physically input that paper survey into, you know, an Excel file or a um, quant quantitative analysis program file in order for the analysis to be able to be ta take place. And sometimes we collect data in formats that we don't actually intend to use as part of the analysis. We collect data in certain ways because it makes sense to the, um, the respondent to ask the question in that way. But we, sometimes we need to transform it in order to something to make sense at the analysis end of things. For instance, you might ask people how often they use something and you might give them lots and lots of different options in terms of how often they use something, but you might only be interested in low, medium and high, meaning that you need to transform all of those different options into something that represents low, medium, high users of a particular product. So, step four, analyze the data. So we'll go through these in more depth later, but just as an overview of the different types of analysis that need to happen. So qualitative data, there is a number of techniques. The two ends of qualitative data are essentially quantitative analysis, which is more deductive. So this is when we sort of have an idea of the variables of interest. So basically we look for and we count the number of mentions of that idea within the interview transcript, the focus group transcript. Basically we are looking for particular things. On the opposite end, we have things, uh, interpretive analysis, sometimes called grounded theory analysis, which is more inductive, which is basically, we don't know what we're looking for and we get an interview transcript and we start looking for what are the variables or the ideas that are emerging out of the data. So the difference between when I say deductive and inductive is that deductive is that you know what you're looking for or you know what you want to measure and therefore you then go to the data and look for it. Inductive is, I don't know, and you go to the data and you go, okay, what is the variables that the data is telling me? So essentially one is sort of from variable down to data and the other one is from data up to variable. 
uh, in terms of quantitative data, so we have descriptive analysis, which is more inductive, um, and the other types of analysis which we'll be covering is testing for difference, testing for association, and testing for interdependence. So in terms of testing for difference, you know, males versus females, liking of Coca-Cola, you know, males, 56%, females, 44%, fantastic. Is that a statistically significant difference between those two groups or those two samples? That is a t-test. So that's how we, you know, if it is statistically different or significant difference than, and, and men like Coca-Cola more than women, then the um, recommendation to Coca-Cola would be, well, you should be targeting men because they like you more. Or it could be men like you, you have a women problem. You might need to look at, you know, if you actually want to target women, you aren't doing it effectively, depending on what the, the, the problem that Coca-Cola is facing. Testing for association. You know, if you've got two variables, how are they related together? You know, is one causing the other in a regression or are they simply correlated where if something happens, something else seems to be happen happening at the same time? And finally, we have this test for interdependence. So this idea that we can group variables together or we can group people together. So how are these variables interdependent and how are these people interdependent? So we have variables, we do a factor analysis, and if we're doing people, we do a cluster analysis. Why well, we do a cluster analysis basically tells us what segments exist in the market. So it's a really powerful tool to as interdependence. So, and finally, we need to transform data into information. So in terms of answering our research questions, we need to be able to present the data to the client in a way that the client understands. You know, they might not understand all of the ins and out, outs of the statistical analysis applied or the qualitative analysis applied in that, you know, as it may be, but that needs to be presented in a way that they can understand the steps that we went through, the logic of those steps, and the data itself needs to be presented in a way that is clear, concise, you, know, you might want to use charts, tables, these sorts of things rather than lots of words and numbers. And before we start <laughs> the process, what you know, should a project go ahead? So evaluate, you know, things to consider, the price, the objectives, the confidentiality, and whether inaccurate data is likely to occur. You know, inaccurate data can come from a number of sources, but if you have budget constraints limit, limiting your sample size, you know, if you only, can only do a, a survey of, say, 30 people, you know, that is a very, you know, depending on the size of your population, 30 might not cut it in terms of having unbiased data in which to make any kind of conclusion. So therefore, the project probably shouldn't go ahead. Finally, ethics in marketing research. There are a number of sources of ethics concerns and there are a number of um, bodies that are, are concerned with ethics in marketing research and in research involving humans in general. Basically, do you have to do the right thing? Yes, you do, because you need to answer to the client, um, to the respondents who are providing you with their data uh, you need to, as you are doing this as part of a uh, university degree program, you also need to be responsible to the university and finally you need to be responsible to me as your project manager in this sense. There are, so everyone in this process needs to be open, upfront and honest about what is the purpose, how data will be treated, what kind of confidentiality will be maintained because the client will be providing you with information, products that have, may not be released onto the market, and they are relying on you and trusting you not to tell the world that this is what they're going to do. Particularly um, these kind of commercial and confidence kind of arrangements where if it's a new product, 
the company really, really doesn't want their competitors to find out about it because they might be beaten to market and, lo and, and lose all the money they've spent developing this new product. So, maintain user information. If in a document, in terms of collecting data, um, respondent information is gathered, that information should not be identifying the respondent personally. Do not provide the respondent's full name, address and telephone number in data collection. You, chat, you use pseudonyms, you give the respondent a fake name, you give them an ID number. You don't use their name. Um, in terms of the, the information from the company, don't release it to anyone, even if it's your best friend and you just want to talk about it. You can talk about this brewing, you know, you can talk about the company, this brewing company, you can talk about the product category, but you can't refer to the brand name, the company name, anything like that outside of the confines of this course because of confidentiality and ethics concerns. And respondents have rights too. Respondents can actually choose to withdraw from a research project and therefore you are required to remove their data from any data set if they make that request. So there's a number of different sources of unethical behavior. Don't do any of these things. The client shouldn't be doing any of these things. That is part of my job as project manager is to make sure the client is being honest and up, um, open with us in terms of what they're providing. In terms of research design, don't falsify your data. Don't fake interviews. Don't fake quantitative data. Basically, it just results in bad outcomes. If you fake the input, you get terrible output because you've got fake output. And while you might make your life easier at the front end, you're making your life incredibly difficult at the back end because you don't know what kind of outcome you're going to get based on fake inputs. And just be aware that respondents themselves don't necessarily want to give you honest answers. And it's actually their prerogative not to give you honest answers, which is why we tend to not rely on just one person. So we talk in terms of honesty um, from respondents, we tend to rely on a consensus. So we get a number of perspectives, a number of respondents in order to try and get to the truth and whatever that might be. There are a couple of research codes of ethics that you should be aware of. Both, uh, one is in your textbook, which is from the, let me get this straight, because like Australian Market and Social Research Society, the AMSRS, have um, codes of conduct. And the other one you need to be aware of is the one that is, um, so this one, the AMSRS uh, is in charge of the marketing research industry ethics. The code of conduct from the National Statement on Ethical Conduct, conduct in um, Human Research comes from the government and is the code of conduct that um, relates to human research in universities. Guess what? You are doing marketing industry research for a client within a university. You are subject to both ethical um, codes of conduct. So make sure that you are familiar with both. Um, the first one is available in your textbook as part of Exhib Exhibit 1.7. The second one I have made available on Wattle. And in signing the contract with the client, you are signing, um, agreeing to follow these two codes of conduct. So in terms of the um, industry codes of conduct, um, it covers things like the code of professional behaviour, what um, as a research provider, what you need to do um, as providing service and also the client's responsibilities back to you. It also includes policy on interviews as a method of data collection. It has um, relate, policies relating to uh, respondent privacy, how that should be maintained and the rights and responsibilities of both the uh, researcher and the respondent. And finally, we have um, it's 
implications for uh, the client in terms of them commissioning research to be done. In some cases, when it comes to these kinds of projects, I have actually rejected clients um, from student uh, research projects based on ethical concerns about the type of research that they wanted done. We've had um, clients that wanted medical products, uh, medical products for children under the age of 16 or under the age of 18. Anything involving children, anything in involving medical um, products is hugely problematic for marketing researchers and ostensibly should actually be conducted by more of a medical research specialist rather than marketing researchers because you know, if you're going to be injecting someone or getting someone to swallow something, we have the responsibility that that thing is not going to physically hurt someone. So just be aware that sometimes you might want to reject clients because what they want done is not appropriate for your expertise and your field of research. So finally, marketing research generates information to facilitate marketing decision making. It is a form of evidence and we use different types of evidence, whether secondary or we have to, or generating our own primary data. We use different types of data, um, qualitative and quantitative, and we use different types of um, designs, causal, exploratory, or descriptive, in order to try and get to the best possible answers to the research questions that will then solve the problem of a marketing client. Um, so we have these sorts of things and finally make sure that you do it in the most ethical way available because we want to be the good guys. So that is the end of the overview of what marketing research is. There is um, another video in terms of the overview of the course and I'll make that available as soon as I can on Wattle.